So welcome to today's Author's Corner. I'm Joe Webby. I head up the Entrepreneur in Residence program for Harvard Alumni Entrepreneurs. Uh, please feel free to turn on your camera. We've muted uh, your mics. Uh, you can send us the questions by private message. We did receive a lot of questions uh, in advance. And just to give you for our new guests uh, about HAE, we're a volunteer managed locally organized nonprofit connecting nearly 12,000 Harvard alumni, faculty, and staff uh, throughout the university and globally. Uh, please join us on HAE Connect, and we have our 14 local chapters. Today, we have a very uh, special guest who we've been looking forward to, Professor Joel Peterson. He was a uh, former, now retired chairman of JetBlue Airways, uh, retired in May 2020. Uh, also former chairman of the Hoover Institution and founding partner of Peterson Partners, a Salt Lake City-based investment management firm with a billion dollars under management. He's a business leader, investor, and teacher who has worked firsthand with over 2,300 businesses, hundreds of partners, and thousands of leaders. Since 1992, Professor Peterson has been on the faculty of Stanford Graduate School of Business, teaching courses in real estate investment, entrepreneurship, and leadership. He was the original seed venture investor for several unicorns, including Bonobos and Asurian, helmed by some of his former students. Uh, he, was, he formerly served as chief executive officer of Tramel Crow Company, the world's largest private commercial real estate development firm at the time. Professor Peterson is an alum from HBS and received his bachelor's degree from Brigham Young University. Uh, Professor Peterson has been awarded the Distinguished Teacher Award in 2005 and the 2016 Robert K. Apple Award at G Stanford GSB. Professor Peterson, welcome to today's session. Good to be with you. Great. Um, so I know you have a presentation for us. I'll stop sharing my screen and, and hand it over to you and then we'll I'll take the Q&A afterwards. Okay, I'll just share my screen, uh, but I want to encourage anybody who would like to uh, interrupt at any point in time. Um, the more that we can make this a dialogue, I'm really excited about this audience. I think this is the, a bullseye audience. Uh, I've been teaching and working with entrepreneurs. I was telling Regina before we got started that I started my first uh, business when I was 11 years old. And I've had several businesses, and uh, so I've been an entrepreneur or teaching entrepreneurship for a long, long time. So I love the chance to, to talk with you all. Um, <clears throat> so, and I understand this is called The Author's Corner. I've never really felt like an author, but I do have a couple of books. So uh, I've been teaching, as uh, Joe said, I've been teaching at uh, Stanford Business School for a while. And here are some pictures that uh, kind of reflect that there's the Hoover Tower, which is kind of an iconic uh, view of Stanford. Whenever you see pictures of Stanford, you see the Hoover Tower. I was the chairman of the Board of Overseers there for a number of years. Uh, beneath is, uh, I'm with Oscar, um, who is the, uh, the head of uh, United Airlines. And then beneath that, I'm with Ray Dalio. Ray Dalio is an HBS grad, 1973. He was in the same section and we were actually headmates in Gallatin Hall, for any of you who've been to Harvard Business School. And then up in the upper right-hand corner, I'm, this is me teaching this quarter uh, at the GSB, which has been online and really challenging and, uh, and difficult. Uh, on the left are kind of the courses that I've, I've taught. So um, I wanted to make clear our um, allegiance to Harvard Business School um, because I've been there, I've had two brothers go there, a daughter-in-law that's been there, a son, a daughter, and another son who've been there. And Stanford, I've just been on the faculty. So we have a profound relationship uh, with Harvard Business School that goes back uh, 46 years, I guess, 47 years. I've also had this experience. I, I spent uh, 19 years at Trammell Crow Company, starting out as a leasing agent. I became the treasurer, then the CFO of the company, then the managing partner of the company. And if anybody wants to talk about it, I was fired, sued in three jurisdictions and spent three years in litigation uh, after doing a turnaround there. And then I was asked to join the, the board at Franklin Covey. It's actually the Covey Leadership Center. Uh, we merged it with Franklin Quest. And then I, I uh, started teaching at Stanford and then formed my own uh, businesses, several of them, uh, Peterson Partners, Peterson Ventures, and Whitman Peterson a real estate uh, investment firm. Uh, 21 years ago, I joined JetBlue before we had airplanes even, and then 12 years ago became its chairman 
and then for 10 years I was at Hoover. So that gives you kind of an idea of the uh, part of the experience that I'll draw. And the reason I, I uh, touch on that is because I want you to have a sense of where my conclusions come from. Uh, and they've included these seven unicorns, three large turnarounds, 250 enterprises, and then 2,500 real estate projects all over the year, all over the world. They also include uh, a course I teach in leadership at Stanford where we've had these folks whose pictures you can see as guests along with these and many of them I'm sure you recognize, but they've been fantastic mentors and people that I've been able to listen to over the years about what works, what doesn't, how do you build an enduring company or how do you fail? Um, so I've been interested in this in the failure start 70% fail by the 10th year, which is well known and only 25% of the seed investments get to uh, an A round. Um, we've been fortunate enough to see about 75% of our seed investments have gotten to an A round. Uh, and I think there's some reasons for that. Most of these businesses, as you all know, where entrepreneurs uh, morph quite significantly, they change their business plan from what they thought they were gonna be doing to what they actually do, those that uh, succeed. So I've, I've written a couple of books and we'll talk about these, but they really base, are based on all of this history and experience, both failures and successes. Uh, and I wanna talk a little bit about that today. So I'm, I'm interested really in this idea of how do people get from an idea uh, to a product or service all the way to a profitable business? And I've realized in teaching MBA students primarily, although I have some from, from other uh, of the schools at Stanford, that there are some really good maps for that. And the fundamental maps that get you to a profitable business include the following four maps. First one is this kind of operating map, which is captured in the income statement, where fundamentally as an entrepreneur, you can read either increase your revenue or cut your costs. And there are lots and lots of ways and lots of tools Lots of what, uh, lots of uh, methodologies for that, but that's fundamentally the first map is this income statement operating map. The second map is really a balance sheet map, which reduce you can either reduce capital intensity, the cost of capital, or you can change the sources of capital. And there are ways to think about and do that more elegantly. Uh, the third map is this sort of team map, your human resources map. How do you develop a team uh, that goes all the way from recruiting all the way through firing somebody, but getting the right team on the field. And then the fourth map is this strategy map, which is all important. And how do you build a moat around your business? And uh, there's always build or buy decisions there. And you can do new channels, customers, offerings, or processes. So those are the fundamental maps that people have for building a profitable business. <clears throat> I, I wrote the word bonobos there. I'll see if I can go back. I wrote the word bonobos uh, there because uh, I wanted to remind myself to tell you a story. Some of you may know the firm bonobos. Uh, these were a couple of my students who had the idea, they were actually selling pants out of the trunk of one of their cars. And they had the idea that they could sell men's pants that fit over the internet. And um, I thought this is a really dumb idea, but I listened to the, to the pitch and by the end of it, I'd become their first investor. And then I went on the board eventually to kind of become the lead director. And I used to go early to the board meetings as the lead director. I was always there 15 minutes early. One day I had the wrong, uh, the wrong uh, time for starting the meeting on my calendar. And so what I thought was 15 minutes early was actually 15 minutes late. And you know how you do when you're 15 minutes late, you don't say much. So I sat quietly for 10 or 15 minutes into the meeting. And finally I said, um, so when do we make our first dollar of profit? And the room just burst into laughter. And I said, what is so funny about that? And they said, we had a bet as to how long it would take for you to ask when we make a profit. So I was really very focused, uh, not on clicks, not on eyeballs, not on a lot of the things that today's entrepreneurs measure, but on profitability. Because I think fundamentally, once you're profitable, you're not reliant upon the outside capital raising uh, to survive. So I really like to get business. I, I really like building profitable businesses. But then I realized that a lot of these businesses never became enduring companies. They were unable to transition to that next level. So I started thinking about the lessons learned from these areas and realized that I'd had 
these unicorns and these turnarounds. And there were some real lessons uh, buried in that that I might be able to capture uh, as kind of a manual that would help folks like you or others who are on an entrepreneurial journey uh, to be more successful at it. And I'll tell you, uh, if we get a chance, I'll tell you a story of my wife being stranded on a mountain uh, for a night um, and lost and search and rescue is out looking for her and why that provoked me to write this uh, book. But in any event, this idea of building a profitable business has this set of maps um, that I just went over. The idea of building a durable enterprise, however, has a different set of maps. And those maps have to do with these really simple but very fuzzy notions of trust, goals, team and teamwork, and then a series of execution mindsets. And I thought, you know, if I could capture those in a way that would be helpful to entrepreneurs, that would be a value. And so I, I kind of tapped into my building uh, experience, my development experience, and, and looked at, you know, how do we make buildings stand? And it starts with a foundation. Uh, this is actually a project I built, a residential project I built, where we had to drill 55 feet uh, down to bedrock and put these piers in so we were on bedrock. So I started thinking about, well, what is the bedrock for building an enduring enterprise? And could we drill these piers all the way down to bedrock and secure not just a profitable business, but an enduring enterprise? And uh, here's what happens when you don't. Uh, and again, it goes back to this idea that an idea isn't a profit, a product, a product isn't a profitable business, and a profitable business doesn't necessarily become an enduring enterprise. So what I'm solving for is this idea of how do we turn a profitable business into an enduring enterprise. So uh, we published this book at the very worst possible time. There are no bookstores that are open. They're starting to open maybe a little bit now, but it was right in the midst of the lockdown. So we published it right in the midst of that. You can only get it uh, through Amazon. Uh, so it's been out for, uh, I guess, almost two months uh, now. Uh, but the idea was, uh, what I call, how do you become a five tool leader? And I'll describe that. And the, the peers that need to be drilled are this, these ones of trust, mission, team, and execution. And I'll talk a little bit about each of these. And that the leader, the five tool leader has to be entrepreneur, manager, administrator, politician, and presider, or at least make sure that those are uh, within the enterprise as he puts together uh, the, the whole team. So uh, the five tool uh, entrepreneurial leader then gets all the way around the compass. In other words, there's, is able to effectively deal north, south, east, and west with all of the constituents that uh, need to be dealt with. So the idea is if you can get these three fundamental peers drilled and then get the execution steps, and I say there are 10 that every entrepreneur I've ever dealt with and I've coached a lot of them, dozens and dozens of them, and been on some 36 boards. Every one of them runs into these same 10 thorny problems. If you can do that, you can summit. You can get to the top of the mountain. You can deliver results. And that's fundamentally, that then goes back to um, kind of uh, increasing trust levels, allowing you to hire a better team, refining your mission. So it's just this circular uh, process. So let's start out with a five-tool player. Some of you who uh, are historians or baseball fans will recognize on the left, uh, Willie Mays. Willie Mays was a neighbor of ours when we lived in Northern California. He just turned 89 years old. I'd become friends with Condi Rice at the Hoover Institution. And I learned from her that her mom was Willie Mays' teacher in Birmingham, Alabama. So small world. But uh, Willie Mays is considered kind of the original a uh, five-tool player. Shoot, if you touch anything on this uh, thing, it advances. So the five, if, if there are any baseball uh, scouts here, you'll recognize that they look uh, for the player who can run, throw, field, hit for power, and hit for average. And those are the five-tool players, and they're rare. Willie Mays was probably the greatest of all. You'll notice on the right-hand side, I have the five-tool entrepreneurial leader with a picture of Alan Mulally. And uh, when I first wrote this book, I had it read by several people. And they said, well, Alan Mulally's not an entrepreneur. After all, he ran Boeing 
and he ran a Ford Motor Company. How can you list him as an entrepreneur? I'm, and I'm saying, it's not an entrepreneur, it's an entrepreneurial leader. But what are the five tools? Well, they innovate, they stabilize, they lead, they organize and manage complexity, and they empower others. So they have, they, they have tools of the entrepreneur, the presider of the administrator change agent that you'd find in an agency, of a manager of complexity, and of a politician. So they're really multifaceted. And if they only have one of them, they probably will not be able to create a durable uh, enterprise. So the idea is how does this entrepreneurial leader drill all of these peers and make sure they exist? So let's just go through them really quickly here. The first one is this idea of trust. I think trust is the most powerful thing that an entrepreneur has. And particularly if you've ever gone through a turnaround, uh, you better be trusted by your investors, your lenders, your suppliers, your distributors. Trust is that what gets you through that, but it's actually what allows you to make uh, decisions that are flexible, that are durable, that allows you to innovate, allows you to change your mind. If people trust you, things aren't nearly as uh, time consuming or as expensive. So it's this idea of willing, willingly ceding a measure of control. Um, and trust, fundamentally for those of you who are entrepreneurs, it starts with becoming trustworthy. You know, you have to be trustworthy and that means that uh, you understand your core values, you deliver on promises, and for most of us, it means that we've significantly rewritten our personal operating system. So in the book, I talk about three mantras that I use uh, to change my personal operating system. It was getting in my way. So you can rewrite your operating system, that, and that will help you become trustworthy. And then you have to migrate that to the organization as a whole. You have to build a high trust culture. And uh, this is when I wrote this first book, The Ten Laws of Trust. And basically said, you know, here are the here are these ten laws, and I give examples and ways to look about it. I actually published it with AMA. AMA was American Management Association. They came to me based on a number of articles I'd written in LinkedIn, and said, "Gosh, we think there's a book here." So we published the book, and um, uh, it was bought by Harper Collins. And Harper Collins then later came to me and said, you know, we, we ended up with a number of titles from AMA. We actually think this is an important one. Uh, we'd like you to consider redoing it, uh, republishing it, but we need 30% more material if you're gonna do that. And um, I said, well, I'm not, I'm not sure I have 30% more to say. And they say, well, what do people ask you when they read this? When you go and talk to them about that, what do they ask you about? And I said, well, there are two questions. One is they wanna know, what is the level of trust in my organization? I have no idea. And they said, most leaders don't know what level of trust exists in their organization. So I worked with Franklin Covey and we developed a diagnostic tool where with 10 questions, you can figure out if you're a high, medium or low trust organization and you can measure it longitudinally. So you can see, are we becoming more trusting as a team, as a company, as a family, any kind of an organization? So that was the first one. And then the second, question they asked was, what if I've been betrayed? You know, what do you do then? And I said, if anybody who's trusted has been betrayed, if you never trust, you won't be betrayed, but you'll just have a very small life. And so the issue is, what do you do when you're betrayed? How do you overcome it? So I put in some business school cases uh, with a series of questions that teams can talk about uh, and with some suggestions on, as to how do you overcome uh, betrayal. So that was the notion of the 10 laws of trust. That becomes the first peer. That becomes the peer. If you want to build a great, durable enterprise, it has to have a level of trust um, for it to be successful over time. The second thing is this idea of mission. Um, <clears throat> you know, having clarity. I always talk to my students at Stanford about you're faced with a whole mountain range in front of you uh, when you get started, and you can climb any of the peaks. And the trick is to pick the peak that you can climb and that your entire team wants to climb. If they want to climb this peak, uh, they will belay each other. You won't have to motivate them. They want a summit as much as you want a summit. So what is that peak? And get clarity around it. Give people a line of sight from what it is they do to the summit and you will not have a problem. The example I always use is this uh, example of Winston Churchill. Uh, after the Germans crossed the Meuse River uh, in May of 1940, um, the British replaced Neville Chamberlain, and both Chamberlain and Churchill went to speak 
to Parliament. Chamberlain received a warm ovation, uh, was very well liked. Churchill was um, much less uh, welcomed, uh, but he was talking about blood, toil, tears, and sweat. And, he, and in this 150-word paragraph, he used what his mission was five times, victory. And so, And you can see him holding up two fingers there, the V sign for victory. He was all about victory. So when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, he came and spoke to the U.S. Congress and then went up to the Parliament in Canada to speak. And he was pulled aside by Yusuf Karsh, the Armenian-Canadian photographer who was world famous, to get a picture of the great man. And after shooting a bunch of pictures on the left that you can see there, Karsh reached over and grabbed Churchill's cigar and he snapped the shot of this picture of him glowering, which has become the iconic picture of World War II, which really captures the mission of Churchill. Great businesses, great entrepreneurial companies, great entrepreneurial leaders figure out that mission in a way they can capture it in a way that everybody understands it. So here's a few examples in the business world that you'll recognize, the Microsoft one. You may not recognize the JetBlue one, I, I do, and everybody recognizes the Marine Corps one. But this idea of really, is there an inspiring mission? A mission statement is not a mission. I have uh, companies identify the five words that they would like their brand to be known by and debate them, wordsmith it. If, if, it's, not a, if it's not something that comes out of the corner office by a presider that says these are the five words, if it's instead generated by the people in the company and they own that mission, they really care about it and it, uh, it tends to get done. The third uh, one is um, team, you know, and how do you ensure that you've got the best team on the field? Well, it starts out with sourcing great people, then interviewing them, doing due diligence on them, making, getting your team to participate in that, onboarding them thoughtfully, assigning them, and then this all important coaching or feedback. Feedback loops are really critical. And then ultimately, you're either gonna demote or promote or reassign somebody. And then if you don't want the deadwood problem in an organization, which is one that entrepreneurs have a lot, there's a lot of, there's this problem of the entrepreneur, uh, the found, what they call the founder's trap. The entrepreneur unable to do the things to become an entrepreneurial leader. They light fires, they innovate, but then are unable to do what it requires to really build a great enterprise. And one of the toughest things for entrepreneurs is letting people go. And so learning how to do that elegantly, thoughtfully, gracefully is really important. Then we get finally to execution, you know, where the execution is. So once, once you've got the team in place, uh, once you've got a clear mission, uh, once, once you've uh, developed high trust, people then you have these execution steps so in interviewing entrepreneurs uh, early and late stage they all say these are the 10 toughest things they have to do we can talk about those maybe in q a i'll just say a word about each the first thing is making decisions under conditions of uncertainty if you went to harvard business school you really realize that that's what they're teaching you to do which is fundamentally pulling the trigger before you have all the information you could possibly have one of the things you'll learn as an entrepreneur is if you wait until you have all the information, you've already made the decision. You've made it prematurely that you're not gonna do something, somebody else will have done it. So you have to know when to make decisions. And often that means that you're gonna make mistakes, you're gonna to have to redo them, et cetera. But really that becomes one of the more important things you do. The second thing you do is sell. I don't know any businesses that succeed, become enduring companies without revenue. And so learning how to sell effectively. And I, one thing I would say about selling is MBAs don't like to do it. I always tell them it's probably the most important thing they can learn how to do. And it's basically a question of listening, learning to really listen and solve others' problems, not pushing product on them. The third one is negotiating. I try to teach my students about negotiating uh, serially, not episodically. In other words, realizing that negotiations uh, go on and you'll have repeat relationship with people, not just one time hit and run and move on, that your reputation follows you. And that if you really solve for fair and you learn how to do it creatively, it's one of the things that allow you to build an enduring company. Raising capital, no business gets there without raising capital. There's a lot to learn about that. Nobody gets there without communicating. I always say you have to do it 
before, during, and after events, and you have to communicate bad news as well as good news. And uh, so learning to communicate effectively. And then I think that the biggest element of learning to be a great communicator is listening. And so that's one of the skills. Uh, running meetings, if you really think about your life as an entrepreneur, and if you consider every conversation, every one-on-one, -on -one, every phone call as some form of a meeting, getting really good at running meetings is a critical thing. Using a board effectively. I've been on boards that have destroyed companies, and I've been on, on boards that have actually helped to create these great companies. So learning how to work effectively with a board is a vital execution step. Uh, overcoming adversity. Most entrepreneurs in their journey will run into adversity, either huge uh, enterprise threatening adversity or something that is uh, a rock along the way, a pothole along the way. And learning to deal with that graciously, effectively, speedily is important. Surviving growth. Many organizations that I've been with uh, have trouble when they grow too fast. And so learning how to manage growth effectively is the ninth entrepreneurial challenge. And then the final one is change. Fundamentally, you've got to be changing. You've got to be dynamic, organic, responsive to the market, anticipative, anticipatory, uh, and you have, to, you have to be able to manage that. So those are fundamentally the execution steps to deliver on promises. Um, <coughs> I have, I've learned in my career that if I can break the execution steps down into projects where I have a champion, deliverables, timetable, and a budget, uh, that I can deliver on projects. I can manage projects. And I can typically manage 10 or 12 projects at a time. And then I just have these rules that I sunset uh, every committee, every project. I daisy chain them. By that, I mean I link them, one project to another in reporting. And then I get one page reports that we monitor. And uh, so fundamentally, it's this idea of drilling these four peers all the way to bedrock, making sure that you've got an entrepreneurial uh, leader. And that means that they have these characteristics either within themselves. My guess is if you're listening to this, you will recognize that you're good, you're really good, naturally good at one or two of them. You can probably learn to do one or two of them, and that you may need to hire somebody and make sure that you've got the other uh, base covered by somebody else. It's rare that you have somebody who's really great, world-class at all five of them. Uh, and that allows you to go all the way from idea to enduring company. I wanted to just give you this uh, little bit of encouragement to think about this book. I know people don't read books uh, anymore, but Graham Weaver founded Alpine Investor, very successful for him. He's one of my... Uh, he actually wasn't one of my students, but I've had him as a guest in class. And he had this nice uh, comment to make about uh, the book and is really using it with all of his entrepreneurs. And then uh, Jim Mattis, who's the former Secretary of Defense, said this. And I, I'll just say one last thing in that uh, Stan McChrystal, who was on my board at JetBlue and the former uh, head of JSOC, the four-star general that led uh, Special Operations Command, which are the SEALs, the Rangers, Force Recon Marines, et cetera. Uh, he wrote the introduction to the book. And so I kind of feel like I can retire now completely with uh, McChrystal giving me the intro and Mattis giving me this feedback. So with that, um, what I want to do is just be re as responsive as possible to any questions any of you has. Um, Thank you so much, Professor. That was, that was very insightful. I mean, you covered the four maps of building a profitable business, moat building, being a five tool player, five skill entrepreneurial leader, uh, the 10 laws of trust. I mean, this book is uh, jam packed. And what I wanted to ask you to start off with, uh, you, you started uh, kind of, you know, working on this book way before COVID times. So why do you believe in, in today's business world and the world at large that, you know, there's this, this necessary uh, traits for uh, the type of leader that you define in entrepreneurial leadership, especially during these COVID times? Yeah, so I actually think it's way more relevant than ever. I think the, wor the world of the presider is kind of over, the world of the pure politician. You know, so we have a lot of leaders who, who really just kind of do one thing and they're in stable, uh, predictable enterprises. I think the world is not predictable. People are going to have to rethink rethink what it is they offer. That requires an entrepreneurial skill, but it's not just the entrepreneur, not just the person who lights the new fire 
Entrepreneurs would like to think that, but I've worked with it with enough of them to realize that the fires go out. And how do you turn a fire of a campfire into a bonfire into a wildfire? And getting all the way from a campfire to a to a wildfire really requires some of these other skills. And more so than ever after COVID, people are going to have to reimagine their covenants with their customers, with their employees, with their suppliers. And those are going to take entrepreneurial skills along with skills as a politician, as a presider, as a manager of complexity. So I really wanted people to get their arms around this new complex notion of the Alan Mulally, Stan McChrystal-like entrepreneurial leader, because I think that's the kind of leader who's going to lead us into the future. Is that why you believe that uh, any entrepreneur or manager can master these skills? They don't. Uh, these are not qualities that can be learned in, uh, in business school? Well, so I'm a big believer in people being able to learn. I think this Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours is a powerful notion. I think you can improve. I, I give the example of the three mantras that I use to basically change the lens through which I see the world. And I was able to do that. So I think you can do a lot. But I think most of us are unable to do all five of them and get really great at those. So we have to realize where we're not good. For example, I am a terrible administrator. I think if I were the head of an agency where policy and the application of policy were the core way of getting things done, I would be a miserable failure. I recognize the power of policy. I know it's important. I know that precedent and how you manage things so that you respect precedent is really important. So I just make sure that I've got good administrators around me who are able to do that. So I think really understanding yourself. You may recall from the slide that one of the things I said was understand your core values. Well, your values aren't things like integrity or virtues. Your values are where you spend your time, your money, and your mind share. Those are your priorities in life. Mm -hmm. And you'll find when you examine your priorities thoughtfully, you'll, you'll see some gaps. You'll see some things you don't like. And you want to make sure that you cover those bases. But so, yeah, the, the short answer is yes, anybody can get there. But the odds are high that they're going to have to hire in uh, folks to fill in for where they're not strong. Definitely. Is that why in the book you start kind of with the foundational quality of, of trust? And uh, why do you believe that, you know, securing others' trust begins with assessing your own core values? Because fundamentally, the, the reason we trust other people is because they deliver on promises. They do what they say they're going to do. That's why we trust them. And people who don't have core values, who are predictable, we learn not to trust. You know, it's, another thing happens too, and somebody is highly trustworthy, what happens is all the people who work for them regard them as predictable. Well, I know how Susan is gonna think about this. This is how mm -hmm. she behaves. Mm -hmm. They then can make decisions. They don't need to wait for Susan to make every call. They can make a decision in Susan's place. And so becoming trustworthy allows you to empower other people in the organization. So it starts out there. You'll never build a high trust organization unless the leader is trustworthy, unless they're predictable, unless their core values are solid and shared by others. So it, it is such a foundational element. Now, I know there are a lot of businesses who've been flashed in the pans, who've done well in the short run, but it's amazing how many have failed to when that has not been present. Definitely. Uh, so in, the, in your presentation, you mentioned the summit and the line of sight. And in the book, you stress the importance of building alignments to achieve you know, that mission. So how can entrepreneurial leaders begin to align their core values with the practical aspects of everything that we're facing with budgets and uh, you know, everything that we've planned is sort of just you know, falling apart in this COVID times? Yeah. So it's really helpful to have a map. You know, if we're winging it all the time, you know, making decisions ad hoc, it will be very hard for others to follow. I learned the most powerful map I ever learned uh, from Marvin Bauer, who was a lawyer at Jones Day and then the head of the McKinsey uh, consulting organization. He wrote a book in the 60s, I think, uh, called The Will to Manage. And it was quite a simple notion, but he basically said you have to have alignment between your philosophy, which is fundamentally your values, what your objective is, mm -hmm. what strategy you're going to use to get to that objective, what are the tactics? In other words, the who, when, where, how we're going to get there, and then whatever you measure, you'll get what you measure. 
And if you align those five things, you'll find that organizations kind of run themselves. And so I found in times like these, really teaching people the connection and how a certain tactic drives uh, the achievement of a goal, which is consistent with our values. And so we, we're gonna be rethinking our values with our customers, making sure, for example, at JetBlue, we had to say, what, was, what is our covenant with our customers? And the very first item that we agreed uh, with 21 years ago was safety, was our number one value. That as an airline carrying 40 million people around here, we had to be safe. And so we said, is safety still our number one value? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Well, now it expands from operational safety to health safety. We've got to make sure yep. that people feel that it's health, that breathing the air is clean, that they're not on the airplane with a bunch of other sick people. We have to take temperatures. We have to do um, have people wear masks. We have to not rent out the, the center seat, at least for this point in time. We have to sanitize our planes. On turn. So we have to do so safety now means something else. So I think if you really think about in these COVID times, this map and say, okay, let's run this map top to bottom. Let's ask every question top to bottom. What are we measuring? Mm -hmm. Then you'll find that everybody will get on board. People will agree. If you're making the ad hoc decisions, it feels that way to people and they don't get on board, they disagree. So that, that's one of the reasons that I love this notion of maps. Mm -hmm. you know? By the way, let me just say one other thing that comes from the airline industry. Yeah. Pilots, even those who've flown for 25 years, uh, will sit down in the cockpit with a checklist. Mm -hmm. Every single time they take off, they have a checklist that they go through. And so people that are my entrepreneurial students who've got this book, they say, hey, this has really been a helpful checklist. I mean, I know most of this stuff, but I won't think about it every time and so I want to have the checklist. So that's the idea. And I actually think in, in times like these where people are stressed out, you know, to sit down with a checklist makes you feel a little bit warm and fuzzy. Like, mm -hmm. okay, I can get there. And going back to this notion of the maps, is that sort of aligning the willingness to pay of your customers? So now the willingness to pay during this COVID times, you know, to fly JetBlue and other airlines is a lot different. And then is that kind of like aligning that with uh, the mission? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think your business model then dovetails in with what it is you're delivering. Because fundamentally, think about what, what I call VOSTC, which mm -hmm. is values, objectives, strategy, tactics, and controls, which is okay. this map, this, this alignment map. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're, you're really making sure that that's in place. But that is to deliver a business proposition. In the end, what you're doing is you're delivering something of value to customers that costs them uh, less than it's worth to them and more than it costs you to produce it. So that's the fundamental equation of business. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to make sure that all the pieces are in place, but there's nothing like having a checklist to say, okay, we've got to cut costs. We've got to increase revenue. We've got to change our distribution channel. It forces you to go through this checklist of items that allows you to get to a proper business plan. Definitely. As you, so as you acknowledge in, in, the, in the book, the success of every entrepreneurial leader depends on securing the best possible team. But, and you also place a priority on hiring people with values, uh, consistency over professional experience or technical competency. Why, why is that so? Well, so I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think you can hire people with technical talents and experiences and everything. But you better darn sure make sure they've got values that you share. If there are values conflicts, I promise you, things will break apart. Your values are your priorities, and they're typically heartfelt. They may have been learned at your mother's knee or whatever, but they are really are, are so strongly felt that when people have values conflicts, they really don't end up, they don't compromise them. Mm -hmm. They'll compromise controls, they'll compromise tactics, they'll compromise a bunch of things, but when they get all the way to the top of the pyramid, to values, they won't compromise them. Mm -hmm. Tremel Crow, who I have first worked for, said uh, that he hired people for brains and heart. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, he was saying, I, co I can't change any of those. You know, people have an IQ that is going to be very difficult for me to make any difference in, and their heart, their character, what they think is important, their values, their priorities. I'm going to have a hard time changing any of that. I can give them experience. Mm -hmm. They can pick that up. So that's how you end up prioritizing that. And I've learned over time, I've made a number of mistakes 
just being so enamored by somebody's experience. I think, boy, if I just had that person, it would solve all problems. And mm -hmm. I've missed the value thing. It's actually created all the problems I ever needed. And how can we assess that as early stage uh, entrepreneurs and founders who are just starting our companies? How, what are maybe some tactical tips for that? So I think sourcing great people, it starts out that way. And I think getting a number of sources, I think people who tend to hire themselves run into trouble. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to have uh, diversity, you have to source from different things. Then, then I think uh, having in-depth interviews. I, I've worked with one company uh, who's actually founded by a Harvard Business School guy uh, who's, who spends four hours in an interview with a, with a candidate. And he goes all the way back to kindergarten and talks about every time they made a decision and why and what were their thoughts. And he really understands what, how that person ticks. For that. So I think you know, getting help with that kind of thing uh, is really quite helpful. I think doing due diligence then. And I don't, um, I don't uh, let others do the due diligence for me. Uh, I think a lot of people think, oh, well, I'll just have HR do the due diligence. It isn't a checklist kind of thing that you, you really have to get on. Somebody has to trust you and, and understand that you're going to keep information confidential. Doing second and third order uh, reference checks mm -hmm. is really powerful. So if you've done, you've done the careful sourcing, um, you know, had somebody help you with the interview process uh, and do what I just said about, um, about onboarding, uh, I think you can reduce the chances of that being mm -hmm. a problem. One other thing that I've learned to do over time is to give people a project before I hire them. Okay. That sounds a little wild, yeah. but uh, I think post COVID, you're going to find a lot of people are out there looking and you can say, I need you to look at this, that, or the other. There's something about, you can, you can typically tell within a couple of weeks of working with somebody, whether you enjoy working with them, whether the quality of their work is good, whether they're flexible, all the things that you need. So I think that's another technique. And then the final one that I would say to you is uh, feedback. Make sure that feedback channels are wide open. And I always make the deal with somebody I hire, say, may I give you feedback in the moment? By the way, they always say yes. Mm -hmm. Nobody I've ever just hired said, no, I don't want feedback. Uh, so in the moment, they, and it's just a nice thing to say, may I do that? Uh, and then take feedback from them. If you can get that two-way communication going, the odds of being able to rechannel their efforts are quite high. And so the odds of, of having a good hire go way up. Great. Uh, we have two questions in the chat. I'll, we'll take those before the rest. So Autumn Wang, uh, she's asking, you mentioned the book towards the end of your presentation. I don't know if that was the 10 Laws of Trust or was there another book that you mentioned towards the end? Um, uh, so, so maybe it is the 10 Laws of Trust. I'm yeah, not let's sure if you mentioned it the book. Um, okay. Um, but yeah, I think the 10 Laws of Trust to me is, is a helpful way to get your head around the power of trust. You know, a lot of people think of it as this fuzzy, vague, uh, I feel good about you, therefore I must trust you. Mm -hmm. and I just, I just wanted people to know if you factor analyze trust, it has elements to it and you can get better and better at being smart about trust and mm -hmm. about being wary. Uh, so maybe that was the book. I hope yeah. it was. <laughs> yeah, I think it was. Uh, next question from ID. She's asking, uh, how do you suggest to kind of build that co-founder uh, relationship? Do you have any, any steps that you recommend? Well, I think co-founders really have a responsibility, not only to each other, but to the enterprise as a whole. If co-founders have a hard time with each other, it impacts everybody. It impacts the business. So I always tell co-founders to think through everything that could go wrong and talk it through. Say, okay, we don't get along. What are the, what are the off ramps? How are we gonna do this? Because you wanna do that in a way that doesn't damage the business or damage either of you. So talk about that before it's a real issue. I think there's something really powerful about imagining issues, talking them through and having a set of principles. So I would, I would just never go into business with a co-founder without talking about what happens when the, either the business fails, we don't get along with each other. Mm -hmm. And you can get, and I, I guess the other thing I'd say about that is you can get good help from uh, experienced attorneys, mm -hmm. really good thought what I call counselors. The, the old word for attorney was counselor. These were wise people who had seen yes. a lot of things. Get, get a counselor and have that counselor work you through fair ways to unravel things. Mm -hmm. 
So Nicole uh, said the book you mentioned was The Will to Manage by Marvin Bauer. Was that it? Yes. Okay. Yeah, The Will to Manage. Thank you. Yeah, that. if you read it, you'll say, well, this is really mundane. But I, I would ask you to you know, really think about these principles and imagine. So I boiled them down, use slightly different words from uh, Bauer. And I think I, I've maybe simplified. So maybe if you read what I've written about this same process, it may be a little more uh, with the times. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, he's the originator of the idea. And so I wouldn't want to, you know, grab his idea and claim it for myself. It was really mm -hmm. his, his alignment uh, model. Great. Uh, I know you touched earlier on the, the summit and uh, kind of what are some of the most common uh, entre the challenges that entrepreneurial leaders face in their quest to deliver results and, and reach that summit, uh, if you will? I think one of them is the, the whole idea of a summit. Mm -hmm. You know, I, at Franklin Covey, we, inter we uh, interviewed management teams of seven, eight, nine people, you know, the C-suite, and asked them what their three top goals were. And out of seven, eight, nine people, we would get 20 top three goals, which all that means is they don't have top, they don't have three goals. Uh -huh. They're not clear about it. So I think one of the main things is clarity around winning. What will winning look like? You ought to be able to put words around winning. And so if you do that, then it's clear you're all climbing the same mountain and you have the same line of sight. The second thing I think is this idea of being belayed. Uh, you know, for any of you who are rock climbers, you realize that uh, you want to be roped together and some of the climb is going to be on a cliff and you want to be belayed to people you can trust. And so understanding that and then having kind of a covenant that when you're belayed, nobody drops the ropes, nobody leaves. You know, you have to say when we're, we're on the cliff, we're all going to stay there. We'll get to a meadow uh, later on. We'll be able to get to a place where if you want to get off, you don't want to stop the climb, you can stop the climb. But while we're belayed, while we're climbing the summit, don't, don't drop the ropes, don't leave, because mm -hmm. we're connected. So there's a covenant that you have as a management team. I think clarity around it and clarity about covenant are really the two main things I would say to summiting. Great. Uh, before going back to, to the book, we, wanted, we usually ask our guests what's uh, you know, exciting you these days in terms of entrepreneurial opportunities. And if, let's say, an entrepreneur wanted to pitch you uh, how would they nail the pitch if they're trying to pitch you? So uh, I find that there's a lot of entrepreneurial opportunity in tough times. Mm -hmm. A lot of the great companies of the world have been founded when things are tough. Uh, so I, th I think this is not a moment to shy away. I think there will be things that have worked for years and years that just don't anymore. So that opens up opportunities for entrepreneurs. Uh, now, in terms of pitch, I would say, uh, think about the, the notion of an elevator pitch, mm -hmm. of a one-page thing. Remove uh, all notions of um, promotion. Mm -hmm. You know, just describe what the market is. Don't overstate things and know where the threats are. I, I find it just all the more compelling when somebody says, here are the three things we've got going for us, and here are the biggest threats. Because nobody has a clear-cut path to success. There are always challenges along the way. I want to know that an entrepreneur understands those challenges and has a plan to, to deal with them. And would you start off the elevator pitch with the team or more of, let's say, the traction or uh, the problem you're trying to solve? I think the most powerful thing is to realize what the need is in the market mm -hmm. and why it's a need and how, how whatever product or service you've designed will meet that need in a unique way. Then I always look for things like, how do you build a moat around it? You know, a lot of times people have a good idea, but no way to protect the idea. It's really easy to steal the idea. And so I want to look for a moat around that. I want to understand the team. I look for uh, kind of four buckets that I evaluate deals on. And uh, one of them is the product or service. One is the market. One is the deal structure. I think you can actually screw up a good uh, opportunity by structuring it the wrong way, you know, where the, the, the incentives just aren't aligned or aren't thoughtfully done. And then finally, I think it is the, the leadership, you know, whoever the entrepreneur is, has to be able to see around the corners, mm -hmm. has to have grit, persistence, you know, creativity, not be able to uh, be flexible, abandon what it is they're doing really, and kind of develop these five skills 
of the entrepreneurial leader in order to really build a great enterprise. I look for all of those things. Great. Uh, I know we've come to the end of our time together, but I wanted to close with one last question. What is your, your ultimate goal for the entrepreneurial leadership uh, book? And if there's any call to action that you would like from the, our community? Well, I would just love it to be able to help entrepreneurs. I don't, to, I don't need, I'm 73 years old, so I've never, never sought fame. I've stayed very low profile my whole life and I'm happy with that. Um, I've got seven kids and 28 grandkids. And I think high profile is not good for any of them. So I'm happy to stay low profile. I've made enough money in my life that I, I typically give away whatever I make. So it's not that. Happiness for me is really what happiness is when I see my entrepreneurial students succeed. The greatest joy I have in life is seeing people become happy, productive, peaceful, joyful, real self-actualized human beings. And I think within an entrepreneurial context, it's just the best way for that to happen. So if this book can nudge, you will give people an idea or two, a checklist or two, a way to think about a thorny problem or two, uh, I'll be a happy camper. <laughs>